In a sport where all fans want is to see fighters take risks and fight the best, only a few in recent years had the courage to do so. Most fighters wait years before taking on top challenges, but Jermaine Taylor was different. He didn't just have ability, but he also had ambition and drive. Jermaine Taylor was born on August 11th, 1978 in Little Rock, Arkansas. Taylor's upbringing was rough, with his father leaving him, his mother, and three siblings when Taylor was only five years old. Taylor first entered a boxing gym when he was 13 years old. He sparred that very same time and got bested decisively. Taylor didn't quit and created a connection with a trainer named Ozell Nelson, who decided to stick with Taylor. However, as an assistant to Taylor's main trainer, Pat Burns. Taylor became so dedicated to fighting that he couldn't graduate, making Taylor instead settle for a GED. Taylor's amateur accomplishments were stellar. He won two Golden Glove titles, two PAL titles, the 1996 Under-19 National Championship, second place at the 1997 US Championship, and a third place finish at the 1998 US Championship. Taylor's dream was to become an Olympian representing America, and he reached that goal, earning a place on the 2000 USA Olympic team being only the second person from his home state of Arkansas to do so. Taylor had a solid Olympic run. He came up short in the end, but he still made a name for himself, earning himself a bronze medal. Taylor got signed by, at the time, HBO Boxing's Lou DiBella. Taylor would go pro very soon. On January 27, 2001, a 22-year-old Taylor would make his professional debut, taking on 17-4 Chris Walsh. Taylor would win by a fourth round TKO. Within two and a half years, Taylor would build up a marvelous record of 16 wins, 0 losses, and 0 draws with 12 knockouts. Taylor would have his first 12 round fight taking on Illinois' Alfredo Cuevas. Cuevas was a journeyman and Taylor showed off his arsenal, dominating and schooling the older Cuevas to a very wide, unanimous decision, winning every round and winning his first title, a minor version of the WBC belt called the WBC Continental Americas title. On June 19, 2004, Taylor would take on his first true test, facing contender Raul Marquez. Marquez was experienced, having a record of 35 wins and 2 losses. Taylor outclassed him, dominated him, schooled him, and dropped him in round 9 before Marquez's corner waved off the fight in the corner. Taylor is looking extremely promising. Five months later, Taylor would take on an even bigger challenge, facing ex-world champion William Jopi. Jopi was just coming off a loss to first ballot Hall of Famer Bernard Hopkins in unification by unanimous decision. He was a truly respected and an elite fighter. Taylor completely outclassed Joppy, dropping him in the fifth round and even outperforming all-time great Hopkins' performance. Taylor cruised to an extremely wide, unanimous decision victory. Fans wanted to see this young, hungry lion and Taylor take on the older, much more accomplished Hopkins. After Taylor would destroy an overmatched opponent in three rounds, the big fight between him and Hopkins was set for July 16, 2005. As good as Taylor was looking throughout his career, and as talented as he was, he was still the underdog for this bout. Hopkins was achieving greatness. He was an undisputed middleweight champion. This fight was for all of Hopkins' marbles. He was currently holding a historic 20 consecutive title defenses and hadn't lost a fight in 12 years. Hopkins was also the number one pound for pound fighter in the entire sport, according to Ring Magazine and most fans. Taylor used his jab effectively early on, sweeping the first two rounds. Taylor continued outworking Hopkins in rounds three and four, but the rounds tightened, and one judge gave Hopkins both rounds three and four. Taylor was currently up, but he wasn't separating himself from the great. In round 5, there was a headbutt clash, causing Taylor to get cut. The fight was becoming more and more competitive, with fighters trading rounds. Taylor was still up, but Hopkins was gaining ground. Hopkins badly hurt Taylor in round 10, and was starting to wear down and outlast the younger Taylor. Hopkins would then proceed to sweep the last two rounds on all of the judges' scorecards. This is a razor-close fight, one that can easily go either way. We go to the score totals. Judge Duane Ford scores the fight 115-113 to for Taylor. Jerry Roth scores it 116 to 112 for Hopkins, and the final judge, Paul Smith, scores the fight 115 to 113 for your winner by split decision, and the new undisputed middleweight champion of the world, Jermaine Taylor. Taylor has accomplished greatness. He's done what most all-time greats didn't, and that's go undisputed, and he did it at the young age of 26. The fight versus Hopkins was very close and disputed by many, claiming Hopkins deserved the victory. Bernard was so appalled by the decision that he attempted to get the decision overturned, but failed. The only solution left was to rematch, and they did. The rematch was set for December 3rd. Unfortunately, this time the fight would not be for the undisputed crown, as Taylor had to vacate his IBF title to secure this fight. Once again, Taylor started strong. He builded a big lead early after 6. He was outclassing Hopkins and attempted, attempting to remove all doubt from the first fight. 
but once again, Hopkins' experience came in clutch for him, and Taylor's leaky gas tank cost him a lot. He was able to make a very strong rally, winning almost the entire second half of the fight. This fight was just as close as the first fight, and we once again go to the score totals. After 12, all three judges scored the fight 115 to 113 for your winner by unanimous decision victory, and still the unified, not undisputed, middleweight champion of the world, Jermaine Taylor. Taylor would get the nod once again and solidify himself as one of the best in the sport. Taylor would almost instantly get ordered from the WBC to take on world-class fighter Winky Wright. Six months later, Taylor and Wright would face off. Once again, Taylor would have to lose a title, this time to WBA, as he didn't pay sanctioning fees for that belt. For this bout, Taylor was convinced that Ozell Nelson, his first ever trainer and his longtime assistant trainer, to replace Pat Burns. Emmanuel Stewart was now Taylor's head trainer. This was another extremely close fight for Taylor. It was back and forth throughout, with both fighters struggling to gain a rhythm. And after 12 rounds, the judges ruled the fight a draw. Taylor would bounce back six months later to outclass tough Kasim Uma to a decision. Five months later, Taylor would take on junior middleweight champion, moving up in weight, Missouri's Corey Spinks. Taylor was down on the cards very early. Spinks was coming to win and made Taylor go in the second gear. Taylor would start to figure out Spinks throughout the fight, but Spinks wouldn't give up too much ground easy. He was still keeping up with Taylor throughout, and after 12 tough rounds, Taylor was awarded the split decision victory, once again escaping with his titles and his undefeated record. Four months later, Taylor would take on young and hungry Kelly Pavlik. Pavlik was on the rise with a record of 31 wins and zero losses and at 25 years old. This seemed to be a bit of a surreal moment in Taylor's career, as he was now the proven champion, taking on the young and hungry contender on the rise. This fight delivered. It was all action. Pavlik came out strong, taking round one, and sending a message early to Taylor. But Taylor reminded Pavlik what he was up against and sent an even bigger message in round two, hurting Pavlik badly with a right hand, then hitting him with a massive flurry before dropping him. Pavlik would recover and fight on and keep the fight competitive. In round seven, Pavlik shocked Taylor hurting him with a right hand and following up with his own flurry, landing multiple devastating shots before referee Steve Smoger waved off the fight. Taylor has officially been dethroned. As expected, Taylor wanted to get revenge on the only man to officially beat him in the pro ranks. He was granted that opportunity. The rematch was set, but this time for no belts. The fight was staged at a catchweight of 164 as Taylor was struggling to make weight. Taylor went back to his original trainer, Ozell Nelson, but it didn't save him as he'd lose again to Pavlik this time by unanimous decision. The fight was close throughout, but Pavlik pulled away in the later rounds to clinch the victory. Taylor was at rock bottom in his career and he needed to rebound. He took on ex-former super middleweight world champion, Jeff Lacey. The winner of this fight would be set to take on the winner of Carl Froch versus John Pascal for the WBC super middleweight title. Taylor dominated Lacey, bouncing back and winning a comfortable decision. Taylor's earned himself another big fight and another big opportunity. Froch beat Pascal and Carl Froch vs. Jermaine Taylor was set to take place in spring. Taylor had to fight an excellent fight for 12 rounds to beat Froch, as he gave away the Pavlik fight by fading late, and lose the later rounds in both Hopkins fights and in the Winky Wright fight. Taylor took this fight seriously. Taylor started the fight strong, taking an early lead on the cards before hitting Froch with a beautiful right hand in round 3 that would hurt Froch before falling up with 1-2 and getting the knockdown. Froch was tough and survived. Froch was doing big halfway through, but a reoccurring pattern in Taylor's career haunted him. Froch was down big, but this didn't change the fact that Taylor's gas tank would cost him. A bad gas tank, as I should say. Froch took over the second half of the fight. Heading into round 12, Taylor was up on two of the three judges' scorecards and was up wide enough to where all he needed to do was survive. Froch, knowing he needed a knockout and knowing that his gas tank was far superior to Taylor's, went on the attack. Froch would hurt Taylor with a big right hand a minute into round 12 and would continue the onslaught throughout the round before finally dropping Taylor with about 50 seconds left in the fight. Taylor would get up and get hit with a barrage of shots before referee Mike Ortega jumped in to stop the fight. Taylor would get stopped with 14 seconds left in the bout. Taylor would show a desire to be great once more, joining the Super 6 tournament, a tournament to determine the best super middleweight in the sport. In the tournament, Taylor took on German former middleweight title holder, undefeated Arthur Abraham. Tragically, this fight played out exactly like his previous defeats, all mixed into one this time. He began the fight ahead, dominating Abraham, but once he lost a point for a low blow in round 6, the fight slipped away from him. Abraham would begin racking up so many rounds that he took the lead under judges' scorecards and most of the fans, heading into round 12, where he had the same idea as Froch, and after pursuing the knockout in round 12, he viciously KO'd Taylor with a devastating right hand. 
Jermaine Taylor consistently showed ambition and courage. This would be the end of Taylor's prime, or at least close to prime form. Happily for Taylor, his boxing career didn't have the most tragic ending, with him winning his final five fights and defeating Sam Solomon in his final pro fight to become a world champion once again. But sadly and unfortunately for Taylor, he had fought many demons outside of the ring. On August 26, 2014, Taylor got arrested for allegedly shooting a cousin following an altercation with him. On January 19, 2015, Taylor was arrested for assault charges and he was sent to Substance Abuse Rehabilitation Program. On July 9th, he was charged with battery for hitting another man in the program. On July 18th, 2017, Taylor was arrested and charged with third degree battery, misdemeanor interference, emergency communication as a result of domestic disturbance and felony terroristic threatening. On August 29th, 2018, Taylor was once again arrested for domestic battery. Jermaine Taylor throughout his career showed true ambition, bravery, and heart. He had many shortcomings in and out of the ring, but be remembered as a tremendous talent who has been fighting demons throughout recent years. We all hope that Jermaine finds the help he needs and gets to enjoy his retirement.